here at the literary arts and the literary community as a whole as well. It is our privilege to recognize the writing of Stephanie Nina Piotzilas. My name is Sony Toneme and I serve Chicago Institution as Michael I. Woodell, Director of Literary Arts. After today's remarks, we will have a short audience Q&A and a book signing. We also have behind us orders and a cash bar after we can mingle together, discuss and have something to eat and drink. We, today we recognize the fifth Chautauqua Janus Prize winner, Stephanie Nina Kiritsilis. The Chautauqua Janus Prize celebrates an emerging writer's single work of short fiction or nonfiction for daring formal and aesthetic innovations that upset and reorder readers' imagination. Name for Janice, the woman god who looked both to the past and the future. The prize honors writing with a comment of craft that renovates our understanding of both. The prize is made possible through generous founding from Barbara Hillary and Twig Branch. We thank them for their continuous support for literature here at the institution. Pizzerilis winning piece, Jean, captures the essence of the prize. Like the god Janus, the Sankofa bird and Pizzerilis story looks to the past and order to move forward. In its content and style, Jean mirrors this phenomenon. This Norwegian family through warm walls move from the present to the past without losing sight of the future. Warm walls, the epigram of the story tells us, are triggers that drag you back in time to relieve the painful scars of family history. Throughout the, his, the story, we become aware that we are what we carry. We are both our, our ancestors and descendants. The traumas are ours, but most importantly, we are never alone. We are grateful to Pizzerillas for giving us this story. We are indebted to our guest judge this year, Aisha Sabatini Sloan for choosing Jean as the winner. While to illness, Sabatini was not able to join us this week, she tasked me to share with you the following. First off, she said, congratulations to all the finalists. It was a very difficult decision to make as the submissions were incredibly well written and I totally enjoyed them all. The winning submission, Jean, hit me on so many levels. There's a fully realized, often hilarious narrative voice, which acts as the perfect vehicle to move through a family, family's experience of inherited trauma, all the while teaching us how to see through the eyes of a time-traveling space robot a sense of curiosity and gorgeously drawn characters compel us forward, but the richness of language, this expertly built wall, creates sufficient space for us to wander around. These sentences are magical, loaded with history and memory and color and space-time and sound. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Nina Spitzerilis. Stephanie Nina Spitzerilis is a prose and comic book writer with work in numerous acclaim anthologies, webtoon, and the Kensian Festival of Zines and Independent Print Culture 2021 as a broken pencil finalist zinester. She's been called a new voice, transforming the genres of science fiction and fantasy, 
and revitalizing the short comic form. She'll tell you that she writes comic book realism. Stephanie's a mom to Amazon, a public health advocate, and, uh, and she masquerades as a volunteer librarian feeling for a public elementary school as Mrs. Peanut Butter. <laughs> She holds degrees from the University of Michigan and Columbia University. She's also a board member of Graphic Monday, Penn State University Press, and a submission panelist for CEX Publishing. Home is the island of Manhattan, and we are glad to add to this bio, Stephanie Nina Pinsilas is a Chautauqua Janice Wise winner. Chitakwa, please help me give a resounding <laughs> welcome to Stephanie. <laughs> spends a lot of time up at night wondering if the universe is a hologram, if all of life is, is it real? Is it a simulation? This week is not helping. <laughs> and I mean that in a very good way. Um, the amount of love that Chautauqua bestows upon artists, whether uh, they are visiting, uh, whether you are celebrating their works um, or prize winners is absolutely amazing and surreal. And I am so humbled and so very grateful, so thank you. And I will be addressing any of you properly as we move along. So let's take a little trip down Jean, Janice, and comic book realism. The Institute for Advanced Study hosted a series of lectures on the theme of space-time, quantum entanglement, and black holes this past May. One of the lectures was given by Dr. Ahmed Almeri it was titled, How Space-Time Wormholes Resolve the Information Paradox. Now, for those of you unlike me, a woman who binges on astrophysics books and lectures because she exhausted alien UFO conspiracy shows on Netflix during the pandemic lockdown. For those of you who are not actual astrophysicists, the information paradox is basically if it's true that black holes consume everything, that, everything and that they also evaporate over time, what about the physics law that says information cannot be destroyed? Without this law, among other things, you can't reconstruct the past from the present. The past is always with us, even when we rather it be obliterated. Whatever the case, at this point, you can picture Nova, the protagonist of Jean, the story that you are honoring tonight. You can picture Nova with you in the audience, with her masterpiece theater pipe and small glass of amaretto, sitting in a plush chair, nodding and saying, yeah, wormholes explain everything. But before we get into wormholes, Let's skip to the conclusion of Dr. Almeri's lecture regarding wormholes in the information paradox. He says, this is an example of physics has to be weird to be normal. Physics has to be weird to be normal. What is this normal? How do we categorize literature into genres? How do we package authors in order to place them on a bookshelf for a consumer? What makes a work genre bending? Like everything in astrophysics, so much of these answers depend on who the observer is and what is the observed object. This is one of the many questions that morphs the astrophysicist into philosopher. Me, my brain short circuits. But whether you subscribe to the Copenhagen or many worlds interpretation that you affect reality with your observation or that you become entangled down with the object as you observe it, I'm still left to having to answer you. What makes Jean genre bending? And it forces me to be the observer that I am not because to me, there is nothing genre bending about it. It is simply my normal. 
A professor of English at the City University of New York, Daniel Bautista, published a paper in the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts in 2010 titled, Comic Book Realism, Form and Genre in Juno Diaz's The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow. He describes comic book realism as, quote, a new kind of genre, a mix of science fiction, fantasy, comic books, and gritty realism that subversively rework, reworks a storied tradition of magical realism in Latin American and Latino writing. Still using his words, a reality filtered through and shaped by the particular traditions, cultures, and fantasies that define the identities and actions of characters. End quote. This kind of genre bending, really its own genre, is found in the novel The Mexican Flyboy by Alfredo Vea. It's a favorite novel of mine, and not just because of its oh-so-comic book cover. You should check it out. It's pretty cool. In The Mexican Flyboy, we have a character who time travels via skills of Mandrake the Magician with a little Doctor Strange, comic books that he reads, and the Antiquithera mechanism, a real device with a sci-fi twist, that he snatched from the US government during a Vietnam War mission, historical fiction, so that he can save historically tragic figures from their gruesome deaths and deliver them into a paradise cooperative in Boca Raton, Florida, that is modeled after a traumatic incident from his own childhood. The book is described as a blend of magical realism, science fiction, history, and comic book fantasy. And I'll add alchemical allegories. It's a demonstration of the important work of university and indie presses, as well as Vea's mastery. And thinking back to yesterday, it really brings me back to Todd Davis's brown bag, uh, bag lecture with myth and poetry. Um, it's almost as if pop culture becomes a modern myth that is infused in our language and our literature. So who is this Nova Odyssey of Jean, our observed object? She's a New Yorker teenager that uses Marvel comic books as a star map to navigate life and her family's wormholes. Nova's definition of wormholes are those little rips through the fabric of space-time that drag you down the scars of family history. An astrophysicist will give you a slightly different definition, namely that Einstein-Rosen bridges, their technical name, connect distant points of space-time, and they are a hot topic right now, even proposed to be behind the fabric of space-time itself via entanglement. As for the New Rican part, it's the diasporic term for Puerto Ricans who call New York City home. Nova's existence in itself is genre bending. Puerto Rico in itself is genre bending. Neither independent country, not really quasi US state, a colonized commonwealth that is continuously drained. A target of US eugenics like Cornelius Rhodes, the doctor hurt accused of murdering Puerto Rican patients, sometimes by implanting cancer into them, as a doctor at San Juan Presbyterian Hospital, featured for all the wrong reasons on the 1949 cover of Time magazine with the tagline, cancer fighter instead of cancer creator. Weird science in Puerto Rico is what author Nelson A. Dennis titles a chapter in his book, War Against All Puerto Ricans. The chapter that summarizes evidence of the irritation of Puerto Rican nationalists and robbed Harvard Law School class of 1921 Val Victorian, Pedro Elviso Campos. Alviso was in prison for his political organization against colonial rule on the island. He reported in his prison cell, strange light seeping in through the walls. Albizo complains of North Americans shooting cosmic rays into his head, Dennis quotes FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. Which sounds out of this world, except if you account for Albizo and other prisoner reports and medical records of radiation sickness. If that's not enough, then Puerto Rico, an island where one third of women were sterilized without consent, where the pill was tested before getting its feminist US brand, a target for US military bombing practice, and today a libertarian crypto bro protopia, that destination that continues a Colombian legacy of genocide and displacement of people. Add 
new yo to this identity, the New York, and you get a Frank Sinatra, I want to be a part of it, New York, New York fusion that also shares an identity with U.S. Black culture. A salsa, what New Yorkans in the 70s did to what Cubans birthed, breaking on two, the golden years of Fania Records, when Nova's grandparents would amass the epic collection of vinyls that would be a precursor to her comic collection. Many of those epic album covers photographed in Nova's neighborhood of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. The album art of Izzy Sanabria that was infused with speculative images from pop culture from which you were marginalized from. Celia Cruz is Wonder Woman. Cheo Feliciano is Batman. Boogaloo was the ultimate in genre bending, disobedient in rules to Latin music, English speaking, and celebratory of its African American, Puerto Rican, gritty New York identity. Joey Baton in the book is prominent in the Boogaloo identity, he himself Filipino and African American, but who identified with Puerto Rican culture, having grown up in Spanish Harlem, similar to my dad. Salsa put a hit job on Boogaloo. But ask those kids if that music was genre bending and some would shrug their shoulders. To quote a famous sailor who loved his spinach, I am what I am. The syncretic novel is what Daniel Bautista calls this thing, where my young protagonist Nova grips reality through pop culture. It's here where I find a home, a girl of the US 1980s, an era that was a mashup of styles in music and fashion that were genre defying. An era where all us kids were fed pop culture products as we ate our sugary cereal watching Saturday morning cartoons sobbing, as Nova would tell you, when Hasbro spilled blue Energon blood, when the whole Transformers to toy line of 84 was massacred to make way for new addictive cash cow toys, responsible for all of us traumatized kids lining up with a nickel in our hands to speak to Lucy, growing up into nihilistic leaning grown-ups because we were unable to believe in heroes or good anymore because what's the point? This can all be traced to the movie Transformers, the movie that did away with Poppy Optimus Prime. Our nascent AI is also not immune. Ask Alexa if she dreams at night and she'll tell you, if I did, I would dream of electric sheep. Anyone? Reference? <laughs> Blade Runner, thank you. Ask her if she's an alien and she'll transport you to Devil's Tower by singing five bone-chilling notes, mimicking the ARP 2500 synthesizer. Sing it. <laughs> do, 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 do. Ask her, she'll tell you. <laughs> Syncretism is what welded the Aruba Orishas to the Catholic saints that surrounded Christ on my grandmother's altar. Grandma's Espiritismo is a syncretism of spiritism of Alan Kardec. African ancestry, perhaps Congolese, says Martha Moreno Vega, a melding of santeria. Basically, seances for the dead, but grandma, my mother recounts, would be smoking her cigar as the Orisha rode her, and the dead used her body. To my mom's teenage horror, my dad came home one time unannounced while they were dating, as grandma was having a misa with neighbors. My mother held her breath wondering his response, he being the observer. I don't believe in that Puerto Rican shit, he simply said, until my Aunt Maria died. The white boy from the Bronx by way of Greece after his family's own genocide story through Auschwitz and Birkenau and then Greece's civil war. Look at that, I have taken you down a double wormhole. Let's go back to the first one. That boy didn't believe in Espiritismo until he saw Maria standing in the hallway behind the amber beads that marked the Wormhole's event horizon, the would-be photograph, staring at him, even though her body was downtown in the morgue. I like to think that in that exchange, Maria was taking him to the afterlife or to the sole paper shredder of Sagittarius A-star the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, 
by mechanisms of that theory of timeless physics. Because last year, as I arranged his own funeral arrangements, he had an attentive undertaker for his Janusian transition. When I asked her what her name was, she echoed the name of my aunt, Maria Garcia. Now we are firmly in the story of Jean. This week at Chautauqua, we explore the theme more than shelter, <coughs> redefining the American home. About 10 years ago, I had written a novel, The Saints of Columbus, whose heart was Nova's love for her slowly, then light speed gentrifying neighborhood, where the projects meets the tenements, meets the brownstones, meets the rent stabilized, meets the condos, meets the market rate rentals. It's become a place, like others, where restaurants replace supermarkets, the bodega replaced by an animal endocrine clinic for pet diabetes. Because what did you think was gonna expect? Because that was gonna happen, Garfield, downing all those lasagnas. <laughs> Pooch and kitty spa and daycare centers. The remaining stores for humans left for frivolous things like rainbow macaroons and nail and waxing salons because suddenly everyone is trying to be as hairless as a babe or forget the 70s entirely. Now you're getting mayonnaise with your fries, sodas without a straw, and take out disposable plastic and paper to eat your food with. The Greeks, with their longevity genes and underappreciated contributions to modern civilization, are true holdouts with their neighborhood diners, even if they too are dropping like flies. There are specialty healthcare shops like endoscopy clinics to see all the polyps from the damage of years of eating out, and enough drug stores to medicate a planet of elephants. It's put the local dealers out of work. How many times are you going to go into Sleepy's, the mattress professional, after getting your Hulk suppressing medicine at Rite Aid? And the proliferation of banks. You would have thought the whole neighborhood had hit the lotto and needed a place for the money to sit like Scrooge McDuck. This was my neighborhood, one I could not recognize in the publication of a prominent observer, the New York Times. My neighborhood was described in their 2015 video, Block by Block, the West 90s, as Woody Allen's New York, Seinfeld's New York, Nora Ephron's New York. No mention or rep of Rocksteady Crew and B-Boys and B-Girls, mixtape hip-hop culture and sneakerhead Bobito, the goat Earl Manigo and his street ball legend, Byzantine hip-hop artist Manny Vega, what about El Comité, and more tenant organizers who fight to protect, protect rent stabilization laws that allow generations to move from poor to middle class. The legacy of these laws, the only thing holding the neighborhood together in its diversity. And I, I see this theme has come up in, in the town hall we had today about moving Chautauqua for, forward. So these are conversations lots of our communities are having. But in my neighborhood, these residents are aging. There was no mention in that video of the old community displaced by Robert Moses where Arturo Schomburg and other black families lived in an enclave created to end housing segregation until urban renewal tore down the homes and made way for high rises and the housing projects where most of my family grew up in. When you hear about publishing needing to diversify outside of New York, it is never my New York that was invited. So I guess we'll miss that train, even though it ran through our yards. Artist Miguel Luciano, a recent visiting artist here at Chautauqua, points out how in most New York City maps, anything above 96th Street in Manhattan simply falls into an abyss. It isn't shown. He points at the irony of the Starbucks on 1491 East 96th Street, one digit away from the cataclysmic 1492 in the Colombian aftermath. One is used to being erased. Take what you know and write about what you love, is what my first writing teacher, Alyssa, Alyssa Albert, told us. This opened a dam in me. I love comic books and my neighborhood. I know my family's history. 
after years of unavoidable observation, takes a pup out of her masterpiece theater pipe. I know wormholes are real. I've ridden through them with my family my entire life, even though my parents forged a very different life for me. In the Chautauqua Water Anthology published last year, Betty J. Cotter writes in her story, The Dowser, what is writing but an act of divination? Like her, I could not divine water like her father did. I could not speak with the dead like my grandmother, but I could be a recorder. Recorders are very convenient tools of the Rigelians to aid their colonization of space. They are sent out to observe, record, and report back what they see, to scout for new worlds, for the Rigelians to colonize, all without emotion. Now, before you think I wear a tin foil hat on my head, I am talking about characters from Marvel comic books. So there are the tools, the means to write a story, but what about the spark that gives it life? The speculative. What if Maria's life went the way they said it was heading? What if this Jean had a daughter? What if I infused my nerdy adolescence and love of home with my mom's childhood environment, where heroin was a family member? We now call this the opioid epidemic. But when it affected black and brown folks in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you were irresponsible, worthless junkies without today's treatment plans and multi-million dollar lawsuits against the dealers, Big Pharma. What if I infused my grandmother's espiritismo? I had seen the weight of my grandmother losing her teen daughter, my Aunt Maria, of never having answers as to why she jumped out of a moving car on the Henry Hudson Highway, the cops threatening grandma not to dig into the why. Now, what if I did all of this and I showed you the literary richness of comic books, the inclusion in their pages that allowed the otherized, the observed, to see themselves on the page with some imagination, just existing, being themselves and more. How comic books, in addition to being twisted mirrors of our society, are escapes to fantastic worlds of what ifs, what could be. I'm still waiting for my mutant powers to kick in. What if I showed you that wormholes are real? No shit. So I wrote a novel about all of this, and then I condensed it in all its massive weight into a short story. If you condense a massive supergiant star to about 1.5 solar masses, about 1.5 the mass of our sun, you get a neutron star into three of our suns and you get a black hole. There's just so much gravity pulling you inside if you get close enough. Too many entanglement opportunities and thus too many wormholes. That's Jean. We inherit more than we think. In our genes where space-time events are encoded in some shrouded system that can tell you that my grandparents were starved in concentration camps, but especially in communities with roots to griot culture of oral storytelling. I think part of why I was fed these stories by my mom, an oral storyteller not exactly by choice, and that I lived through trips down their wormholes surrounded by family as we maneuvered the consequential gravitational waves of wormhole proximity, is because of something Juan Flores points out in his book, From Bomba to Hip Hop, in looking at Abraham Rodriguez's Spider Town. Quote, Rodriguez recalls that when he wanted to be a writer, his teacher told him that it was impossible because there was no such thing. Puerto Ricans don't know how to write. It was what my mom was told when she announced to her junior high school guidance counselor at Joan of Arc, stories in hand, that she wanted to be a writer. So, by that observer's definition, I am genre bending. Theoretical physicist Dr. Julian Barbour bends his genre by existing outside of academia. 
He took a job translating Russian texts instead of the professor track after seeing how this genre would limit him and developed his theories in his quaint home in Oxfordshire, England on his own terms and time. And his theories are not conventional. In his book, The End of Time, he argues that difference creates an illusion of time. And he includes in this book a letter from a woman taken by his work, or an astrophysics fangirl, Gretchen Mills Kubaisayak. She states a position similar to his own theory, quote, our lives are made up of individual moments that layer and coexist with other moments, not a linear sequence of events. Dr. Barbour's recent book introduces the Janus Point, a moment of minimal order in the universe before the Big Bang, where time branched out in two directions, as if the observer, the Janus God, would observe two universes with a shared past. It's a theory that predicts a universe with more order from disordered pasts as we move forward into a future. A universe that defies expectation and writes itself into complexity as it moves along, like a good story. Physics has to be weird to be normal, Dr. Ahmed Elmeri tells us. Order and categories have their purpose, and so does defying them. To create something new when it simply means being yourself, or because you are resisting how categories shut our voices out. Writing is an affirmation of existence, a resistance, an act of rageful love. Thank you, Chautauqua and the Chautauqua Institution for valuing art and literature that enrich our lives and that broaden perspectives. To Sony Ton Ame, the Michael I. Udell Director of Literary Arts at the Chautauqua Institution, guest judge, author, Isha Sabatini Sloan, my mother, Lydia, my husband, Cyrus, first reader of my works, who challenges me to dig further than the new yo of my Rican roots, who places a book in my hand and says, I think you will like this, except astrophysics books, he hates that stuff. <laughs> Cyrus, this lecture is testimony to our literary romance and the worlds you've opened in me. Thank you to all my readers, to editors Matthew David Goodwin, Alex Hernandez, Sarah Rafael Garcia, and Frederick Luis Aldama for including Gene and Speculative Fiction for Dreamers published by Ohio State University Press. A thank you to my three curious girls. And a thank you to donors Barbara Twig and Hilary Branch for funding the Janus Prize. Named after the God that looks both to the past and to the future whose existence upends and bends genre. Thank you. And ended. Thank you so much for submitting that story, uh, because this is the kind of stories that we're looking for at the Janus Prize, and we're looking to celebrate, really, uh, Thank you, Stephanie, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you, everyone, for training us. The food is getting lonely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so are the books. So please help me congratulate Stephanie Nina. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.